good evening, everybody, or whatever time it may be where you are. I'm noticing that we do have people here from all over the world. My name's Nicole Naditz. I'll be your host for this evening and for this program. And I'm really glad you've chosen to take this time to spend with us as we talk about the high leverage teaching practices and how those intersect with high quality project-based language learning. This is the first of two webinars that we will be doing on this topic. Um, the two webinars are different. And so we hope if you have time, you'll join us again next week, actually at the same time and on this same Zoom channel. And I will introduce our guests in just a moment. But before I do, I'd like to give a huge thank you to the NFLRC at the University of Hawaii um, for really spearheading this project and putting this all together and making this possible for us this evening. Our overarching question really is the same for both webinars, and that is, to help us better understand what concepts for, um, that we can pull out of the high leverage teaching practices, which concepts from there will help me better implement high quality project-based language learning for my learners. And so to do that, we're first going to talk very briefly about what we mean by high quality project-based language learning. And really what this is, is a way of looking at project-based learning experiences that focuses on the criteria from the perspective of the learners. So when we're looking at the criteria that we pull together for project-based learning in general and also for project-based language learning, in the past it was kind of written from the point of view of what the teacher does. Now in this model we're looking at it from the lens and the standpoint of the learners. There are six criteria in high quality project-based learning and project-based language learning. And each of those criteria has to at least be minimally present for the experience to be considered high quality PBLL. But it is also important to note that the mere presence of the criteria isn't the goal. That's really considered just the beginning. The highest quality project-based language learning experiences will deeply impact student learning and development across each of the six criteria. So let's take a look at those criteria now. The first one is intellectual challenge and accomplishment, meaning that throughout the course of the project-based language learning experience, students learn deeply, think critically, and strive for excellence. The second criteria is authenticity, meaning that the students work on projects that are meaningful and relevant to their culture, their lives, and their future. The third criteria is a public product, meaning that the student's work is real. It's publicly displayed, discussed, and critiqued, not just by the teacher. And I like to call this when I'm working with teachers in workshops and so on, I call this the work saying that the work of the students has a purpose greater than a grade and an audience beyond the teacher. The fourth criteria is collaboration in which students collaborate with other students in person or online. And they might also receive guidance from adult mentors and experts in the fields that they are exploring and studying as part of their project-based language learning experiences. The fifth criteria is project management, so that students use a project management process. They develop project management skills. This isn't a full skill set. People actually go to college to learn how to do project management. So we want to provide students the opportunity to develop that skill set so that they are able to proceed effectively from project initiation to project completion. And the last component is reflection. Students reflect on their work and their learning throughout the project. So again, these six criteria have to at least be present in order for an experience to be considered a high quality project-based language learning experience. But the goal is to have each of the six criteria be really richly and deeply embedded throughout the work that the students are engaging in. So what I'd like to do is introduce our guests. 
very quickly. We have two outstanding guests with us today. And um, oh, I hope, actually, Rachel, I hope I pronounced the second name correctly. Um, our first guest is Rachel Mamia Hernandez. She is an instructor of Portuguese, Spanish, and Latin American and Iberian studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She holds a bachelor's degree in Latin American studies and a master's in second language studies with a concentration in language teaching. She is currently pursuing her PhD in learning design and technology. Our second guest is Adam Ross, and he is a Chinese curriculum and technology specialist at the Chinese American International School in San Francisco, California. He has taught Chinese at middle and high school levels at Lakeside School in Seattle and college courses at the University of Washington. Adam has led workshops on teaching Chinese, on project-based language learning, and on technology integration in language classes. So given what we heard about high quality project-based language learning, I want to turn the floor over first to Rachel to talk to us a little bit about one project-based language learning experience that she did with her students. So yes, this is a project-based language learning project that I did with my students um, in, a in an intermediate Portuguese language class. And this was a project that actually took one whole year, so two semesters. Um, and it was revolving around the question of building literacy. So it might seem not so obvious to us, but in certain countries, like in Brazil, books are actually prohibitively expensive for a lot of people. So that means a lack of access, especially for young children in low-income communities. And so as a result, we see lower or lower literacy rates and functional literacy rates among low-income populations in a lot of regions of Brazil. So we kind of wanted a project to tackle this question of how can we help at least build child literacy in one community. So our idea was through writing children's books, getting them published and distributing them to a low income community in northeastern Brazil in the city of Salvador. And also um, in this project built in with the traditional literacy, we're building digital literacy skills for my students as well. So they actually came up with their own children's books. We use the tool Storybird, which if you're not familiar with that um, website, it has these beautiful templates and illustrations. So from Storybird, they were able to make the books and um, we were able to publish them and they have a fundraising feature so we're able to actually get them printed and two of my students were able to make the trip to Brazil and visit the community and deliver them. Um, thank you, Jim, for putting up the link. So this was a year long project and throughout the project we sort of built up to the actual writing of the books. So first we evaluated children's books that were existing. So I brought in children's books. They looked at them. Um, actually, prior to that, one thing which I had forgotten, they talked about popular children's stories with their teletangent partners in Brazil. So they um, Skype with students from Brazil, talked about what are popular stories, what are popular characters. Then we previewed actual children's books and we used a rubric to, oh, sure. <laughs> I'll turn on the video. So we used a rubric um, that I had created to evaluate them. And so they were evaluating them in pairs. That's what you see in one of the photos. So they would look through the books together, kind of discuss what they liked, what they didn't like, and on the rubric, evaluate each book. Um, we also, in another photo, you see had a guest speaker. Dr. Savio Siqueira from the Universidade Federal da Bahia, UFPA. And he is actually a professor of English there, but his specialty is critical 
pedagogy. So he actually brought in this critical perspective of representativeness in children's literature in Brazil, or in a sense, lack thereof. So we actually looked at this question of the lack of Afro-Brazilian and indigenous characters. After the session with Dr. Siqueira, or during the session with Dr. Siqueira, we also watched a video um, from a sort of viral video sensation, Menino Gustavo in Brazil, who is a young Afro-Brazilian boy who loves to read and also echoes this lack of Afro-Brazilian characters. So we really tried to sort of um, get the idea of writing stories that would be relevant, looking for images that would represent Afro-Brazilian characters or indigenous characters or sort of uh, have this positive self-love message. And so um, that was something my students tried to build in as they worked on their project. Um, it, we probably had several drafts. So this, like I said, was a project that kind of stretched out over two semesters instead of just being contained within one semester. Um, so there were many drafts. They worked in story, story triangles, so they would share their stories amongst each other. I would give them feedback as well. And like I said, we finally got the books published through Storybird, and they had an awesome fundraising feature. Um, so we were able to do a little social media campaign and have our friends and family and other people buy the books for the children in Brazil. So each book that was purchased went to someone in Brazil and the fundraiser also earned a small amount of um, money and that money was given as a donation to the school that we worked with in Brazil. Um, so that in a nutshell is my project. I don't want to take up too much time. Thank you so much for sharing that. And actually, just so that everyone knows, the way the, inner, the way the program is structured, our guests will often be referring back to these projects as they answer some questions later in the program. So you might be hearing more about this project from a different lens or a different angle as we continue. Yes, for sure. Um, so let's take this next to Adam's project. So we're going to have Adam share his project-based language learning experience with you today. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Adam Ross in San Francisco. Um, I'm not sure if my video is showing, um, but I'll, I'll keep talking until we can figure that out. Um, I am uh, going to talk a little bit about the genesis of a project we have been doing for several years now at the Chinese American International School, or CASE for short. I'll, I'll just refer to it as CASE. Um, uh, Actually, the, 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 the unit was begun by our seventh and eighth grade Chinese teacher, uh, Chen Xiaoqing, uh, or Chen Laoshi, teacher Chen. Uh, she just created a unit on looking at the issue of water use in the world. And this was just purely a unit without any, any project attached to it. But it was relevant to um, our kids, and um, I, I've been neglected to mention, our kids are students, uh, immersion students, who have been studying Chinese since they were in pre-kindergarten at Case. So they, they come into our middle school with already intermediate level uh, uh, speaking skills and uh, reading skills by and large as well. Um, in terms of water, being here in California, we have been in a had been in a drought up until this past winter for several years, and uh, our kids had been learning for some time about the, the need for conserving water, and we wanted to delve into this further in Chinese. So the unit that that Chen Laoshi developed was simply to look at at ways of conserving water in different parts of the world, ways of recycling water, reusing water, all of these things to 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 maintain our water tables better. Um, and then finally, uh, several years ago, along with uh, Nicole and, and uh, Rachel, I joined uh, everyone at the uh, PBLL Institute at the, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and decided that, that, we, that we have a number of projects to work on. And this was one we wanted to develop into a PBLL project. So collaborating with, uh, with um, Chen Xiaoqing, we decided that we wanted to have the students develop projects where they had to go further with looking at 
uh, at all of these aspects of recycling, reusing, conserving water, giving them some choice to decide which of these aspects they're most interested in, in studying, and then producing some content within our LMS, our learning management system, which we use as PowerSchool. And uh, PowerSchool has a nice feature called a wiki, um, a wiki project, which uh, nicely uh, fills the gap left by wiki spaces that, that's, that closed as a website a couple of years ago, uh, where they developed their own videos, their own uh, um, informational uh, um, uh, uh, texts, uh, their own uh, infographics where they can present about their learning to their classmates about and, and to other students in the school about water uses. Now finally, fast forward to th this, this past year and what you're seeing in all the photos is that we just started a new uh, three-week study program in Guilin, China, and we were there in March and April. So we decided that because Guilin is a fantastically beautiful city it's 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 uh, famous for its mountains and its water that we wanted to continue the the water project into our our learning experiences there so um in, in addition to all of the work that we did already in san francisco the kids then went to to uh small classes with teachers at a program and the teachers continued the project to look at water uh um uh issues in guilin itself and then have the students engage in, in uh, projects where they did things like compared and contrast issues of, of pollution in San Francisco and Guilin, or ways that we can serve water and such. And their, their final task was to make a final presentation in groups um, at our final banquet for all of their homestay families that they had been living with for three weeks. So they had a real audience. Um, I was master of ceremonies. You can see me at the top left uh, introducing all of the kids when they came out to, to do their presentations. They did uh, all sorts of posters or they reenacted science experiments that they had done in San Francisco. So you can see the picture below me. You'll see uh, four girls uh, showing uh, a basic water filtration system that they created um, and presented all of this to their, 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 their host families who greatly enjoyed their, the experience, learned a lot from them, uh, got to think about their own water issues in, in a different light and to think about how there are water issues all over the world and, uh, and then found a, a deeper way to connect with, with our kids. So um, I've said it quite a bit right there. I can say more later, but I'll stop at this point. Thank you so much, Adam. I think we're all really intrigued by both projects and it's also just really special to hear about different types of learning situations and what our students are able to do in a variety of types of language learning programs. So we're going to move forward now with a quick look at the high leverage teaching practices just in case not everybody happened to have read the book, which is understandable. Um, so high leverage teaching practices are basically a series of six practices or approaches that teachers take that powerfully support learning. They are not able to be learned um, strictly through modeling and observation. And part of that is because they are so complex. So they need to be deconstructed and they need to be explicitly taught and practiced in order to be developed. And they can be rehearsed and coached. But one really important distinction that is critical to highlight is that they are not the same thing as best practices. Um, as uh, Balam Forzani said, these high leverage teaching practices are core tasks that teachers must execute in order for students to learn. So these are so integral to instruction that they can't be set apart as innovative pockets of best practices teaching because these practices really need to occur in every classroom or learning situation. And today in our, um, in our webinar, we'll be focusing on the first three of the six high leverage teaching practices. So I'm going to give a brief orientation to high leverage teaching practice one, and then we will actually have an interview with um, our guests with Rachel and Adam in order to connect that practice directly back to high quality project based language learning. So here we go. Uh, the first one 
is called Facilitating Target Language Comprehensibility. And there's actually, as they said, all of these are complex. So there's really quite a bit here, but to synthesize it down as much as possible, um, essentially that means three things, creating comprehensible language, creating context for comprehension, and creating comprehensible interactions. So the first one, creating comprehensible language, starts with a deep understanding and application of the concept of input plus one, um, so that we can't just stay at the level where the students are because they can't ever grow. So our input, our use of the target language as teachers in everything we do, but especially in targeted lessons where we're trying to teach them a new um, set of words, functional chunks to use, needs to be just beyond where they are at right now. And creating comprehensible language also means that the language learning experiences are rich in authentic resources, as opposed to just being charts or lists. If we use authentic resources, there's, there are structures built into those and features of those authentic texts that actually help people understand them. So that will actually take us further than using textbook style charts and lists and so on. That second piece, creating contexts for comprehension, involves ensuring that comprehension checks are planned and that they are an active and ongoing part of the language learning experience. So we really want when teachers design learning experiences and they're designing for a day when they are going to provide some input to be really thoughtful about what chunks can we break that input into and what would be a series of checks for understanding that we might use after each chunk so that the teacher knows that they're doing okay but also so that the learner knows that they're getting it and it's okay if we move on or if not we're going to reteach and the third component was creating comprehensible interactions where learners are provided language to ask for help in the target language, to help them stay in the target language throughout the learning experiences, because we want the learners to be using the language as well, not just the teacher. And another piece of this, because it's, it's scary for the learners sometimes, they, they're scared to make a mistake, and we're trying to put them in these interactions. So another piece of this is, embedding and developing and fostering a growth mindset among all of the learners in the room with us so that errors are recognized as a part of the learning process. So with all of that in mind, we're going to take a look at those high quality project-based learning experiences that we just heard about, but just through the lens of that first high leverage teaching practice, facilitating target language comprehensibility. And for our listeners, just so you know, and our viewers, um, there, the, our guests will answer the questions. It's very free flowing. So it won't necessarily be a question directed to a particular person between Rachel and Adam. So here's the first question. As you consider the project-based language learning experience that you just shared with us, what are some of your go-to strategies to facilitate target language comprehensibility for your learners? I'll go ahead and start. Um, so in, in, in terms of talking about the water project, uh, we have a little bit of uh, the benefit of kids who already speak some Chinese or and actually have, have very good listening skills. So we don't have to do a lot in terms of scaffolding. But that said, um, uh, uh, myself and our teachers, we just can't go in and start saying about conservation and recycling and reusing water and not wasting because uh, these are words that, they, that students may have heard before but may, may not have full control over. So we often and try to to, to start a topic just simply engaging students with some simple Q and A to access their, their basic knowledge of, of a topic. And and uh, as I mentioned before, our kids have been learning about water issues in our school in many different classes for some years. So it's easy to start out with the questions um, saying that we're going to be looking at water issues in Chi in Chinese class. So what do you understand about uh, about 
uh, conserving water. And then saying the word conserving, then you paraphrase and say uh, that you don't waste water and that you, you don't use too much water. And then ask students to say, what are ways that they do this in, in their homes? And then the students may just end up using simple language to say, well, when I take a shower, I try to take a short shower and not use so much water. And then uh, the teacher could go on and say, that's a great strategy. This is a great way to conserve water. And then we introduce the phrase jie yue yong shui, the way in Chinese to say to conserve the usage of water. and uh, and then also support, uh, using this embedded in uh, uh, Google Slides, knowing that, we're, we, that we want to touch on these vocabulary items to show them these, these words as we go along, to, to show the pinyin, which is the romanization, the, the, the spelling using Roman letters of these, of these sounds, and some pictures without giving them any English, because we're again an immersion school, we don't want to, to use English, but showing something that might uh, to, to demonstrate um, uh, uh, that idea of, of conservation. Um, and then, uh, then we keep on building these slide decks day by day, recycling ones we've done before and adding new pictures to, to build on, on these as well, just in the, in the beginning. And then um, we also have students uh, have to write down in their notebooks new words that they're hearing uh, or seeing in the Google Slides along with our, our daily can-do statements. So the students will know from the beginning of the lesson that our can-do is to, is to get some basic Basic vocabulary or understanding some basic things about uh, water usage and, con and conserving water, these sorts of things. So that's just a, a, um, a couple strategies uh, to, to, to start the unit. So I'm going to jump in really quickly. Basically, what a really powerful strategy is using the students' prior knowledge as a foundation on which to build new knowledge. Um, and supporting that with visuals and maintaining target language. Rachel, did you have anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, it's so funny. I was going to say, Adam, you're stealing all the things that I have in my notes. But yeah, um, activating prior knowledge was definitely something that I tried to do through having my students um, work together with their teleattendant partners and just getting discussing children's books, getting into this idea of finding out what's popular in terms of Brazilian children literature. So this kind of um, getting to know things and thinking about their own experiences. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is don't be afraid to reuse, revisit, reread, and rewatch things. Sometimes we treat it, okay, we've read that text, it's over. You know, go back, reread, um, watch the video again. Those can be things that can really aid their comprehension. Um, the other thing, like I mentioned and I shared, is rubrics. So this is especially helpful if you really don't want them to break into English all of a sudden. So, you know, they're doing a task and maybe you want to help them have some of that language to discuss what they're discussing, build a rubric for it and, you know, give them those little gambits, those little pieces of the language. So as they're working on the task, they can stay in the target language. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I really liked what you said about rereading, reusing. I, I've joked with teachers when I talk to them about the work, when we're talking about literacy strategies, for example, and my students end up rereading an authentic text, for example, possibly up to seven times, but with a different purpose and for different tasks. And so they never seem to catch on that I got, I tricked them into reading the text again. Um, and their knowledge deepens each time and they catch new language each time that they didn't catch the time before, even if they're focusing on a different task. So you bring up a really good point about not just check marking each authentic resource as we use it as if it's a one and done. I really appreciate that. Exactly. Um, in many project-based language learning experiences, learners encounter a lot of new language. And we kind of touched on this a tiny bit with the previous question, actually. But in this case, what I'm curious about is how do you ensure that learners interact meaningfully and repeatedly with the new words and expressions they will need in order to fully engage in their project-based language learning experiences. Do you want to go first this time, Rachel? Um, sure. Actually, yeah, some of my strategies were similar. Like I mentioned, the, you know, the revisiting 
um, texts, videos, whatever it is that you're using in terms of authentic resources or in terms of resources in general. Also, similarly, and this is in my notes, one thing that my students do, just like Adam's students, is keep a Google Docs vocabulary journal. So kind of ongoing, you know, the vocabulary that they need, that they're learning um, throughout the project they're working on. Um, another thing that has helped is sort of kind of just checking in and having them complete these progress reports. So thinking about where they are and what their needs are as well. Um, and yeah, just trying to keep recycling the things they need to know. Of course, in my case, each book was different. So there wasn't necessarily a fixed set of vocabulary that they were gonna learn that I pre-planned, but it was kind of uh, different depending on each individual learner and the shape of their book. You brought up a really good point though that I think not everyone actually associates with helping learners interact with new words and that was the use of self-reflection and self-assessment where the learners are actually you know, are going to take some responsibility for accounting for their language learning needs as well as their language learning progress. Definitely, yeah, that was something I, I tried to build in was sort of the weekly or periodic self-check um, and sort of telling me where they were. I had originally intended to do the project in groups, so I had originally made group reports too, but then abandoned the group idea just for different reasons. And so I just kept it with the individual progress reports. Well, and that comes from just looking at what it is our learners are showing us that they need. Are you able to um, quickly maybe just give one or two sentences about how you noticed or one or two examples of how you noticed their use of self-assessment and reflection helping them to actually kind of hold themselves accountable for, for using new language that they had kind of self-selected because of their books? I was just, just curious if you had oh, a good example. I you know, I try to, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no worries. It's just, it's, it was four years ago. <laughs> so right? I know. It's a little bit hard to remember, but I'm sure if I went back and kind of combed through things, I could yeah. find an instance for sure. Right. Where students were really like getting deeper knowledge of the words that they needed for their stories. And then, you know, even, or even seeing that starting to become part of how they communicated after that project was over but they still owned those words and their their facility and ease with which they could use some of those turns of phrase in you know the work they did after that for example right yeah i mean even my um each student also made these little short videos um of themselves because not all of them were able to make the trip to Brazil. So they introduced themselves to the learners. And yeah, it's just funny some of the little expressions that they threw into their video yeah. introductions. Perfect. Thank you. Adam, did you have anything you wanted to add to that topic of helping learners interact meaningfully and repeatedly with the new words? Absolutely. Um, actually, I started answering this question uh, from a participant in the chat uh, while uh, Rachel was, was presenting. But uh, we use a number of online tools to extend uh, learning activities for students, either to use in class or outside of class when they're at home. Uh, the one that, that's, uh, that I want to talk about, and I know Nicole has written about extensively, is Flipgrid, which is now a free tool uh, from a sponsorship by Microsoft where kids can, uh, where actually teachers can present present a question or a video or a prompt and then kids will go online without even needing to um, uh, to create an account and be able to create their own uh, short video response or any, if they don't want to video themselves they can just have, an, uh, have a, a spoken response to a prompt so uh, just again going back to the idea of talking about con conserving water after we've introduced that vocabulary we may have a flip grid prompt for all the students saying how or how do you um, uh, uh, 
conserve water in your home or what are your some other good ideas and they all have to go and, and post something and the nice thing about this as a formative assessment is if that if a student has absolutely no idea how to respond or is flummoxed about using the language they can see what other students have posted and get some ideas from them and so we say sure please go watch your your, your classmates but you have to come up with your own idea you can't just simply parrot what, what someone else has said and then we can extend these activities by the next day saying okay go in and and, and watch at least five um, uh, uh, of your classmates Flipgrid uh, responses and then go into our LMS and in our discussion forum please make some comments generally positive we don't want criticism here we're working with middle school students of course saying what you liked about their idea and, and maybe some suggestions and how th th they can do things better um, and, and or or uh, even uh, modify their idea somewhat to make it even better so th there's tasks for them to continually use this and I'll just take one minute as well to uh, to to answer um, Alice Spaniola had a question about strategies for beginning novice learners I actually teach a class for our our parents to learn learn some Chinese and they're zero beginners so I, I even use Flipgrid for them to say go home and talk to your kids and often they have little kids and say ask them what is your name my name is such and such and then video cord themselves with their with their students and in a sense this is a little mini project where they get to interact with their kids that way and you're just doing some basic uh, uh, um, zero beginner uh, uh, learning activities in Flipgrid and or other online tools. Yeah, it's a really excellent point that we want our learners to see our content, which is world languages, and then we tend to bring in other content areas, you know, as part of what we do in world languages. We don't want them to think that that stops when the class ends or when it's a vacation period. So we want to provide opportunities for our learners to continue to engage in the target language with target language materials using the resources that are available and yeah i absolutely love flipgrid i've used it also to have students have asynchronous conversations with people overseas because we can't manage the time difference at all so we can never be online at the same time um, but this allowed our students to talk to their peers in france and actually get a, a reply directly back um, and also when the students give feedback, you know, you were saying the importance of helping them give positive feedback and making suggestions. And another thing I used to like to ask students to do is, or perhaps ask a question to the person um, whose project you're, you're looking at to help maybe, um, you know, to, to help them, ask them a helpful question to take their learning in another direction or go deeper. Um, how do you clarify what learners are expected to understand and do so that they can focus on the concepts and the knowledge and the skills that are central to the content for their project-based language learning experiences without trying to understand every word because i think we all know those students who although they don't know every single word in their native language or native or home languages if they have more than one it suddenly bothers them a great deal that they don't know every word they hear or see in the languages that they're learning. So what strategies do you use to help them focus on what they do need to be able to do and understand and not stop their own learning when they hit a word they don't know? I'll go ahead and start. Um, I already mentioned that in, in our classes, we always have daily can-do statements posted at the beginning. And in fact, we even require our students to write down the can-do can statements in their notebooks. So they're processing what it is, and then we have them uh, uh, say it out chorally and make sure they understand what it is. So the, the kids know what the focus of the lesson will be, and there isn't necessarily the, the expectation that they're gonna understand every single word. They just have to know what they need to do at the end. Um, but but at the same time we have to 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 sequence our activities so there's some level of formative checks or comprehension checks uh that that show that that the students are, are have, have have gained the input they need or process it somehow or at the at, at some level of being able to do an output task with with that um so so our, our classes are, are very interactive and in, in that all of our um 
I'll, I'll speak a little bit about their classroom arrangement. We have pods of, of students all in, in groups of four or sometimes three if it's a smaller group. And sometimes the work is that they just are talking amongst themselves. So for a student to, to stand up and share an idea in front of all of the other 21 or 22 students, for the shy students that might be too hard to do, but then they at least can do it in their small group and then maybe have to, to complete uh, um, uh, just a little exit ticket to show that they've understood what it is if they're if they're too shy to speak up um, or it could just be simply be, be more process oriented as we go more deeply into the project where the students have to take different roles in terms of how they're uh, engaging with the material and uh, filling things out in a wiki project space or uh, or, or creating some sort of uh, um, a, a physical documents or a poster or what have you um, on, on a day-to-day -day basis Thank you. Did you have anything you'd like to add to that, Rachel? Um, yeah, I mean, not too much. I think Adam hit a lot of great points. I think, you know, sort of a lot of this has to do with the discourse community that you kind of shape in your class and making them not afraid to take risks. You know, also in, I think it was Tony and maybe Christine touched on this too, um, in the podcast is um, really, looking at how you treat their errors or don't treat their errors so making them feel you know safe and comfortable in what they're doing um, i think that's also an important part of having them feel like um, they can get a handle on the project and feel comfortable with project-based uh, language learning so i think it's something you kind of need to foster in your classroom from the beginning Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I really appreciate how both of you basically touched back on a couple of aspects from the description of the first high leverage teaching practice. Um, one of the ones that, that came up was that importance of an ongoing active sequence of checks for understanding. And the other one was um, the growth mindset and really fostering that among the students and helping them maintain that because it's not something they necessarily will do naturally. So we're going to actually um, switch gears a little bit and go to the second high leverage teaching practice that we're going to talk about today. And again, we will be talking about it in the context of the um, project based language learning experiences that Rachel and Adam have facilitated. So the second one is actually called building a classroom discourse community. So Rachel let us right into that. And what this means is that the teachers are going to facilitate opportunities for what's called talk in interaction. Um, and Part of that talk and interaction, in fact, a really critical piece, is this idea of um, what they what the authors call an IRF um, protocol, which is in the teacher initiates, for example, a small conversation, um, a dialogue, something they're going to do with the students, and the students respond in the target language, and then the teachers provide feedback which is very different from providing evaluation. So we know in a lot of classes, you know, if the teacher asks the student a question in the target language, um, such as what do you like to do on the weekends, right? And the student says, I play soccer, the a teacher might then say, oh, very good. But very good isn't feedback, it's really an evaluation. So we want to provide feedback that lets the learner know you know what how their response worked in that conversation um, and it could pro it could be by providing a follow-up question or there are a lot of other ways to provide feedback if especially if the learners need a little more direction and guidance in answering that question another piece to building a classroom discourse community is engaging learners in oral classroom communication between the teacher and the student and to make that possible you really have to have familiarity with and among the students. Most of us as language teachers, I think in a way we find this easier than almost any other subject because we spend so much time engaged with our students and having our students tell us about them in the target language, but it is really critically important to build that familiarity. Um, another piece of engaging them in that oral classroom communication involves creating the contexts in which the learners can interact in the target language, including spontaneous interaction and just chit chat. So when I was in class with my learners, it wasn't just 
the lesson that was me being 90% or more in the target language, it was any time I saw my students in the hallway, when they entered class, between activities, I would do all the chit chat in the target language as well. Um, and you want to build on the context that the um, teacher and learners share, and namely the school and the community, if you're looking for some ways to build in some of that uh, spontaneous interaction, there's a whole bunch of resources just right within your school and community of topics that your learners will have some knowledge of and have opinions about that can be harnessed. Another aspect of building a classroom discourse community is designing and conducting oral interpersonal pair and group tasks. So that would be student to student because they can't just interact with me as the teacher. Also, we need to help them understand, um, or rather we as the teacher need to understand the critical characteristics of interpersonal communication and presentational communication. And we need to provide support to students um, to use conversational gambits. And Rachel mentioned that word a little bit in our last conversation. These are language chunks. They do all kinds of really important things in conversations, but they aren't necessarily things we remember to actively teach, but we should. For example, the chunks that we use to make a point or to interrupt or to ask for clarification or to ask someone to repeat or some, a way that we in our target language or our home language might restate a point or go back to a previously mentioned point or hesitate or stall for time. We want to give our learners the tools to do that so that they can engage naturally in these conversations. And finally, we need to provide interactional space. And one of the ways we do this is actually by slowing down the churn taking between the two or three individuals who are talking and really increasing the wait time. And that can be hard because it means we have to resist the urge to fill that gap of silence. And if we do resist the urge and we, get, we don't have this frenetic pace of people feeling like they have to respond instantaneously, what happens is that the learners are less anxious and they become more willing and more capable of providing detailed and complex responses. So we're going to look at how this particular high leverage teaching practice comes out in high quality project-based language learning experiences. And um, my first question, um, some teachers fall into a sort of a trap that gets talked about a lot when we look at writing and research on project-based learning. And the trap is doing projects but not true project-based learning or project-based language learning. And as a result, the learners often culminate their study with a presentational communication task, primarily for the teacher. So how do you provide learners with multiple contexts for authentic interactions within and beyond the classroom as an ongoing part of the events in their project-based language learning experiences. And Rachel, I'm gonna throw it to you to start. Okay, um, so I think maybe an easy way to think about it, and there is a lot, there are a lot more differences than I will mention, but when you think of the sort of projects or what we just call dessert projects, you know, PBL or PBLL is really much more about the process than the final project. So those, you know, just project type, which I have done, and I'm not, you know, demeaning anyone who does them because I've done plenty of just normal projects and not PBL projects, particularly before um, I learned about PBL. So I think those are really much more focused on the product, while PBLL is really on the process. So I think, you know, thinking of it long-term, planning it out. Um, also in the planning, building in flexibility. I think it's important to sort of gauge what is working, especially when it's your first time with PBLL, you know, kind of have some flexibility as well. If this didn't work, you know, what's another direction you could take? Um, so even though you do plan things to plan for a certain uncertainty or a certain flexibility, um, 
in my case, luckily, students were able to interact with other students from Brazil through a separate project called Teletandem. So they were able to have this regular interaction. In addition, I was able to bring in guest speakers. And in my nature and just the way I teach, I always do a lot of small group and pair work. So they are able to sort of, you know, feel this community and have this interaction together as well and interact with me. Um, and another advantage that I often have in my Portuguese classes, I'm the only Portuguese instructor at my university. So I know I will see my students usually for two to four semesters. So I am able to build this relationship over time, although I know not everyone has that luxury. Absolutely. Um, I really like what you said at the beginning about, first of all, that projects have a place um, in the work that we do, but their purpose is different. And, and as yeah. you said so nicely, they focus on the product um, and PBLL focuses on the process in addition to having some, some other components that are necessary. Um, and those interactions that you purposefully plan for, and I think that's what comes out, is you purposefully plan for opportunities for your learners to not just interact with people at the end as part of their culminating event in the project-based learning experience, but to have opportunities throughout the process to interact with different people who are speakers of the target language and who are experts in their own right, the peers who are experts in what they see in the children's stories, as well as the guest speaker that you mentioned from the university. Adam, I know you have some great ideas on this too. What would you like to add? Um, so um, I, I've already mentioned some of them and the fact that we do most of our work in groups so that, that projects are, are truly collaborative, but we really try to, to have, uh, have activities in different stages through the whole project process. So the students have some opportunity to interact with other groups of students and present what they're doing or, uh, or give uh, feedback in ways I've already discussed. But maybe one way to, to, to dive into this more deeply is to share a little bit about a different project that we do. We have our seventh grade students design a template for what they think would be the ideal mobile phone app. And this is something that with 12 and 13 year old kids, they love their phones. And if you have them to think creatively of what they would want their phone to be able to do for them, they have lots of ideas. And then in a, in a, group, in a group of 22, they'll, they'll draw out a sketch, have some, some basic vocabulary about what it should do. We post them all around the room and have a gallery walk and then have the students give little, little bits of feedback and vote on their favorites um, models for this. We, and, and then we end up doing this as a contest, the six uh, 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 templates that, that get the, the most votes end up being the projects at, go, moving forward. And the students who are not chosen, then they become members of the team with that person. And then they have roles of you have the, the, the inventor, who was a person who presented initially, then other kids have to decide are they going to be a marketer, and then they have to design an advertisement for this or a designer where they have to develop what the, um, what the various uh, functions within the app will be like and so on. And suddenly this becomes a, a, a collaborative process. But you know, before they went there, they had to have a little mini presentation with each other that had some high stakes because they all wanted to have their, their own uh, design chosen. And then even as they move forward with that process, there's various steps where they're going to be sharing uh, with different groups about what their ideas are and get some feedback that way. So that, 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 that all of this is embedded with like little mini presentations as they, as they go along to, to build to their final presentation. So you brought up a couple of really important points there. Um, one of them being that personal um, kind of motivation and buy-in to the topic um, and something that is relevant to the students. And that came up right at the outset when we first heard about the projects that you both are doing. Um, and also that sense of really being thoughtful about from the beginning, um, whatever the entry event might be, or how you get this started all the way through the process, building in multiple opportunities for them to collaborate and interact with each other, you know, as well as potentially having opportunities to interact with others, but not just them working in silos, developing something on their own um, without any collaboration with each other. So what do you see as the relationship between this particular high leverage teaching practice of building a classroom discourse community and the high quality project-based language learning elements of 
intellectual challenge and accomplishment, collaboration, or authenticity? Adam, why don't you start? So one big challenge we have working in our school with middle school students who have been studying Chinese for six or seven years up to then is, is oftentimes uh, our, our adolescent students start to reject the idea of, of speaking Chinese all the time. It's not so cool anymore. They don't necessarily want to please their teachers when they were younger. Um, so, so our rationale for doing more and more project-based language learning is to, is to create truly interesting and cognitively challenging uh, projects and tasks that, and that, that, will, that ideally will connect to their own lives somehow. So I've already mentioned the app project, you know, again, mo mobile app, I'm all over that. I love my phone and, and, and uh, I'll, I'll have more buy-in if I can show my creativity that way. Um, but in addition, we also are doing more work to, to connect uh, projects with what kids are studying in their own in their other subjects in their English language uh, classes so this might mean that uh, uh, we have a design lab and the students are having to design uh, uh, things for 3d printers so we decided okay well, we're learning about the first uh, Chin Emperor we're learning about the terracotta soldiers he built for his tomb why don't we have the students create their own terracotta soldiers using a 3d printer but then embed more uh, language learning elements to make a true project-based language learning where they have to develop a story and a name for this person and have an icon that the that the soldier is carrying that tells something about their background and then develop this further and then this is able to to again uh, show their creativity in classes outside of Chinese. Um, they can talk about it in English that they need with our, our design lab teacher, but then find ways to to develop uh, their, their language skills further as they develop their stories behind that. You know, one of the things you brought up actually just hit home because we have a dual immersion program in my school district as well. And in a meeting I was having with the dual immersion coordinator at that site, he happened to just be mentioning the same thing you said, which was as the kids get older, it becomes more and more challenging to convince them to maintain their use of the target language. Um, not, you know, in class, not so much, but, you know, you, we, they were hoping to hear this rich use of target language on the playground and, you know, when the kids are at lunch in middle school and they're not. Um, so I kind of see this as a potential really interesting avenue for, I don't know if research is the right word, but like some development and work around this, because I think this is an interesting um, problem that maybe other, it's not just your dual immersion school and my dual immersion school <laughs> are facing. Um, so you approach that really well with the use of project-based language learning experiences that create these cognitively challenging but both, but interesting and relevant tasks for learners so that there's, they really want to engage in this work and be in the language and also that really critical piece of connecting to the other content areas that's not only going to help them stay in the target language but it's going to just facilitate their academic achievement all across the board um rachel what would you like to add um yeah i mean i think to echo sort of some things that Adam said, that voice and choice is really important for the project buy-in. You know, I'm working with adults, so it's a little bit different, but having them feel invested in what they're doing, I think is really important. And I mean, I think, you know, crafting sort of a more meaningful learning experience where they're able to use the language and you're reaching beyond what's in the classroom outside to either your community or your target language community. Um, I think those are important pieces in keeping it relevant, keeping it interesting, keeping it exciting for them, um, and also intellectually challenging as well. I think all three of us are kind of hitting on the same thing from our own experiences in the classroom. And, you know, for me, I noticed that when, when we did these project-based language learning experiences, the other benefit, the other thing that that provides is our learners stop seeing their time in our language classes as purely an academic exercise because they really do come to see that the language and the cultures that speak the language have value for communication. There's value to understanding them. There's value to 
being they there's a purpose beyond the work we do in class and they don't always feel that with all of their subject areas so that becomes a critical point and they end up wanting to engage in the work more if we are building in voice and choice and if we are um, giving them opportunities to do that relevant work that's both relevant to them personally out of personal interest but that they also see as relevant to something beyond their classroom beyond their school beyond themselves can I just um, yeah. throw in a little thing because I'm seeing some comments yeah I think you know if you can find a partner to work with that's awesome you know I would say exploit your own connections you know look for friends or maybe colleagues that you have from target language communities and they'll probably be more than willing to work with you I know as language teachers, I'm going to say it, we're naturally nerd, nerdy, dorky people. You know, we get excited by this kinds of stuff. And if somebody said, I want you to guest lecture, I want you to be part of my project, I would be more than happy to do that. So I would say, you know, just exploit your connections. It's so easy. I mean, look at this webinar. People are tuning in from all over. It's really easy these days to connect with people, with other classrooms, with other teachers. So... I mean, take advantage of it. So we're going to move to the third um, and final high leverage teaching practice that we're going to talk about this evening. And this one, hold on one second. Mm -mm. There we go. Um, and this one is actually guiding learners to interpret authentic texts and leading text-based discussion. So the first piece to that is um, understanding our use of the word text, first of all. It doesn't have to be print material. And the graphic got cut off a little bit on the right, but it includes things that you listen to, things that you view, anything that is written typically by native speakers of the target language and intended for native speakers of the target language to read or listen to or watch, um, as opposed to something that is written for the purpose of supporting English speakers to learn this language. Um, that's what we mean when we're talking about an authentic text. And the key aspects to guiding learners to interpret these texts and then what you'll do as you lead these text-based discussions with your learners starts before they even look at them. Um, it's really important, and literacy research shows us this, it's really important to engage learners in activities before they read, before they listen, or before they watch, um, especially activities that, that require prediction or that help them make connections, like what Adam explained right at the beginning, where one of the first activities they did was talk about their own water use. Just doing that gets those brain synapses connected and realizing that ready for that next component of the lesson where they're going to learn something about water usage. Um, prediction activities have the same effect. So a piece of this high leverage teaching practice starts before they ever see the text or video or audio. And then we're going to guide students through main ideas and as they become more proficient, details. In some cases, at first, it'll just be really key details. And then as they become more proficient, they can dig deeper and deeper and deeper and get more nuanced um, understandings out of these texts. Another really important piece that I think sometimes doesn't happen as much as we would like in language classrooms is engaging students in opportunities to make inferences from this authentic document and also to guess meaning from context. Because ultimately, our learners are not supposed to know every word and they're never going to know every word. What they really need to walk away with is the ability to use context to help them bridge the gap when they encounter words that they don't know. Um, and sometimes before they even do that, they need to do that quick evaluation of, is this word, is this something I have to know in order to move on with whatever it is I'm trying to do? But if it is, how can I use contextual features to help me um, understand this? Because they aren't always going to know. Then we're going to move, once we've done those things with the text, we're gonna to move to interpreting and discussing test, texts. So these become the things you do after students have read or listened or viewed something. And they include a lot of activities, but the kind we're gonna focus on today is leading text-based discussions. Um, and you'll, 
you'll be doing several things here. Those discussions help you and the learners um, demonstrate that the learners have comprehended what it is they needed to comprehend out of that text. These discussions prepare and support learners to engage in ongoing conversation about the topics that these texts talk about. And as a result, we're going to ensure that the room itself is structured to foster communication um, so that it's easy for our students to communicate and engage with each other. I think you've already heard a couple times tonight how important you know it is to have these students interacting with each other and i know myself i i had the ability to do this thankfully and the flexibility at my school site um my leadership allowed me to change my room setup to be tables i got rid of the rows of desks because i wanted them to communicate with each other all the time um but also we want to going back to something we said earlier we want to make sure that errors aren't the focus of our interactions with learners. So when we're looking at leading these text-based discussions, we want to focus on meaning. And we know that they're going to make some mistakes when they try to explain to us what they are getting out of the text or what ideas that raises for them or what questions they have as a result. And we're going to, if they were able to make their statement understandable to me, I can rephrase it for my learners, for the rest of the learners or do other strategies, but this won't be the time that I'm going to focus on the errors. We'll have other opportunities to refine their language um, structures and vocabulary. And then this process ends with providing closure. So, for example, you might elicit summaries from the students um, and from what they shared and kind of after many students have spoken and you've done these text-based discussions, you can use a variety of strategies and tools to have them individually kind of reflect and summarize on what some of the key points were that they heard that day during the text-based discussion, for example. So we're going to move on to our questions for Adam and Rachel about um, these, about this particular high leverage teaching practice. And the first question, um, is going to Adam, and the question is, what is the role of authentic text in project-based language learning experiences? Well, this is a huge topic, and you know, Nicole, as you're saying, there's a, a huge range of, of texts, whether or not the, they're actual uh, written texts or uh, uh, videos or, or other ways that, that's, that the target language is used in an authentic context. And we don't use textbooks in our, in our Chinese curriculum at all, except for some extensive reading. And we're, we're always trying to curate content online in the form of YouTube videos or articles we find online, um, uh, visuals that we might find. So for example, with the Water Project, we found a series of, of visuals introducing uh, uh, ways of conserving or reusing water that UNICEF put together and translated in Chinese and they're visually uh, enticing because they use these fun colors and cartoon images bigger characters, smaller char characters to highlight uh, in interesting concepts. And these are another entry way for, for uh, getting into those things. But even if you want to do something more complex, we will often will just show a clip of, say, for example, a, a movie or a, or a soap opera that may show, uh, say, for example, a conflict. And then you get to a critical point. Even if the kids don't know every single word, they can follow along the general story. And then we stop and say, what would you do next? How would you resolve this con this conflict? And that that uh, offers a, a point of of inquiry for the students to start discussing amongst themselves about something that they might find uh, interesting there, or or put themselves in the shoes of the character or or something. Um, and then finally, even in just going into actual written text, we, we want our kids to be able to read longer uh, essays. We'll often find authentic texts that are from the news. We may edit them down a little bit because uh, advanced and superior level Chinese writing can be really, really hard, especially for kids who are just at the intermediate level. So we'll, we'll take out some of the more difficult language and then scaffold it by highlighting colors of, 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 the, of um, say, the new vocabulary that, that would be new for them or um, using a different color to, to, to highlight uh, connective structures so they can see um, patterns in the sentences, these sorts of things that, that will help them uh, to dive into a dense uh, uh, text of Chinese given the, the challenges that, that reading Chinese uh, brings along. So these are just a few, few ideas to share right uh, for the start. 
Yeah, we're actually going to, I love that you brought that up because um, next week, one of the high leverage teaching practices will dive into um, looking at grammar through authentic text and, and doing exactly that, finding texts with patterns so that the students can actually see the pattern in action multiple times. And um, that sense of, you know, I've looked at some authentic materials when I want to use them with my learners. I also have had to mark for them, for example, maybe I don't want to remove pieces necessarily because I want, I, I want them to realize that this is the whole authentic text, but I'll highlight for them which pieces I want them to pay attention to. Um, and that allows me to do things like sometimes, as you were referring to, there will be some really like difficultly phrased details that that weren't necessary they do provide additional information for going further in depth for the proficient reader but for the goal i had for my students at the time they don't need that information so finding ways to make it clear to our students what it is they need to focus on and what they can safely ignore or take a look at but not worry about it if they don't understand is critically important and I also love image rich texts I'm a huge fan of infographics for my novice learners um, because it really helps them dig into some concepts that really work wonders for critical thinking even when they're only functioning at the word level because infographics provide that huge amount of visual support with kind of limited use of words um, so that you really only get the keywords you need, which tend to be the words that I've been working on with my learners. Um, Rachel, what would you like to add regarding the role of authentic texts in project-based language learning? Um, yeah, I mean, like you guys have mentioned, they were pretty central to my project. I mean, um, you know, we did a whole evaluation of children's literature and I brought in a bunch of children's books. I think that was helpful, even though my students are adults. I think, you know, they knew our audience were children, so it felt okay to be looking at children's books. And I think it was helpful, of course, for the visual support that they have. Um, with Portuguese, we are a less commonly taught language, so often I'm relying on authentic texts just because there's a lack of material in general. Um, but yeah, I think also in PBLL, you're looking at real world problems and real world issues. So it just makes sense that you're going to be using authentic materials and real world texts like Adam mentioned um, with the water. So yeah, um, I think that's how I've used it, um, especially with the children's books. Yeah, I agree. I think, like you were saying, if we're going to do real world tasks, we need to give our learners multiple opportunities to interact with real world documents. And they don't all have to be complicated, um, but that's going to be critical to their success as well. It also gives, for example, if you're going to do project based language learning with novice learners, we have to remember that novice learners, by definition, function at the memorized chunk or phrase level and word level. And as a result, the other thing they do well is imitate. They don't create very well in the language. That's, that's actually the hallmark of intermediate. So when they try to create, that's when we see the struggles and the difficulties. So that importance of showing them you know, authentic resources that, that mirror the kinds of things we're going to expect them to produce make it really manageable for them to understand what they're aiming for. Um, as well as going back to what Adam said before, having those clear can-do statements and targets, um, you know, for them so that they also have a sense of what it is they're expected to do and what they can safely leave aside. Yes, yeah, just to briefly touch on one project I did, not my big book project, but a smaller um, alphabet book project with a novice class. And that was really, they were each just working on one sentence and they worked with their partners. They had conversation partners in Brazil. So they would um, use a cognate. So it's a similar word in English and Portuguese, starting with the same letter. And they were just producing on the sentence level, one sentence. And they worked on the English sentence, the sentence in Portuguese, and they um, ended up, well, we're still finishing it up because there were more letters than students, but they're working on um, an ebook that, a bilingual ebook. Awesome. Yeah, go ahead. 
Sorry, I'll just jump in one more time. I just want to share with everyone that uh, for our eighth grade students at Case, I, um, I and my teachers completely stole Rachel's idea of her, of her book creation project. And we have a similar book creation project where our eighth graders go and review some Chinese stories that they read when they were in first and second grade. And that's kind of a fun experience for them to go down to the, the, the little kids library after so many years. And then design a, a their own children's story in a similar way where they can use Storybird or Book Creator or or, or create their own physical book, which we bring to a Tibetan region in China um, and share with Tibetan students who are learning Mandarin when they're in kindergarten. And uh, it's a great way for, the, for our kids to, 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 sh uh, to share their own um, creativity, but also to learn how do I tell a story in a way that a little kid will understand it? And what is a story that I can tell that a little kid will, will actually want to read? And again, you have to think, we're working with 13 and 14 year olds, sometimes the boys will write these stories where someone a monster will come and kill everyone or like no 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 don't do that your friends think that's hilarious but you're writing for a five-year-old he doesn't want to read that and so we we have to have them think about about these aspects about who is your audience and so these are things these are skills these are real world skills that, that go beyond uh just simply the idea of reading a, a children's story as well um but but in, in doing so they're going back and rereading their authentic children's literature that they experienced from from before and it also shows them when I do a similar thing with, um, in one case, we actually study fairy tales. And most of our students at my school, at least most of them read fairy tales when they were little. Um, but we, we then revisit them. And when they're older and they revisit what they read or heard when they were younger, you're actually able to deconstruct it so that they're still experiencing the same story and the, the memories that they have and appreciating that. But now they're able to deconstruct it as an older learner now and look at the features and exactly why it is things are done the way they are in children's books, you know, why the pictures are so big and there's one sentence, and, you know, um, there's a use of repetition often, or, you know, you start looking for characteristics. So they're also learning about this content area, which in this case is literature and specifically children's literature. So that's really important. I'm going to um, give this next question to, I just forgot who I did the last one to. Adam, did you go first on the last one? I believe I did, yes. I think you did too. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to go to Rachel. Um, how do you find, when you need authentic resources that support students' inquiry in project-based learning, I get a lot of questions about this, so I kind of wanted to throw this out to both of you too. You know, how do you find authentic resources, especially for learners who are functioning in the novice range? What are some of your strategies when you are about to start, you know, a new experience and the theme of that experience? What's your approach to finding multiple resources? Yeah, for me, like I mentioned, since both of the projects that I worked on were focused on children's books, I again use children's books as a great example because they do provide the visual support, the language is somewhat simplified, there may be repetition. Um, you know, simple one or two words, um, one word books, there's even sentence books for very novice learners. Um, I believe it was Stephen Chudy, who I know is here, um, during his podcast that he mentioned um, even simple things like lists, texts, maps, you know, all of those kinds of things can be much more accessible um, and sort of support learners who are beginning or novice in those cases. We want to look at items that people who speak this language as their native language actually use in their daily lives that mirror the functional range of our learners. So, um, and I'll, I will actually do searches for things like, for example, if I want to do something on geography, one of the things that I'll do is I'll actually go, you know, try to think about at what grade do I think um, French children learn about the geography of their own country and I'll guess and usually even if my guess is wrong Google will still point me to the correct grade level and then you open that up and you find the activities that are actually intended for native speaker children but that um, actually help them 
to build geography skills and awareness and the content vocabulary and so on. So I know that that's another approach that I have used, not just on that topic, but on several topics, but also just looking like at what kinds of lists would be used in this particular topic area. So can I search for lists like that? And if I search in the target language, um, what kinds of charts, what kinds of statistics, what kinds of other items, I don't, whether it's menus or maps or whatever it right, is. Right, or, yeah, like, you know, shopping lists. Right, or right, depending on the topic. horoscopes or, you know, <laughs> depending on what you're doing. Depending on the topic. Adam, what would you like to add? Uh, so I would add uh, really the same things that, that we teach our kids to search, search, search in Chinese. And if they find interesting graphics that have uh, have text in it, please do use them. Uh, again, we're, we're always teaching them, make sure that you are correctly documenting uh, anything you might use in your presentation, having the, the URL embedded so people know where it came from. But we also try to do some things that are a little bit more creative. And, and uh, this year we started actually having the kids experiment using Google Earth and uh, um, uh, Google Cardboard for a 3D experience so that they can kind of cre create a, a space that they would be able to describe things um, about, that they're learning about in China, or in particular, for even for the Guilin program, we had the kids come back and say, introduce something for your families or other kids here at Case about what the, the Guilin experience was like, um, whether it's a, a place we went to in town, or what the neighborhood, what our school was like, or uh, going to the, the terrace uh, rice patties outside of town, what that experience is like, and create that with a narration and some text as well, so that it, it's, it's a, they create more of a collaborative experience in, in doing these kinds of searches. I just expand on that because I know not everyone might be familiar with that. So um, there are, so Google Cardboard is basically just a, it's a small headset made out of cardboard that you put your phone in. And then I wish I don't happen to have one here. I have several at work um, <laughs> where you put your phone in it. And if depending on what you're looking at, if it's if it's something that is optimized for a virtual reality experience or for a 360 degree photo, it, it, tra it takes you there. It's virtual reality. You feel like you're really there. Um, and so learners can both explore. Um, they can go places beyond the classroom using this technology. Um, and depending on the technology that the learners have access to, I know, for example, there's a great resource called Google Expeditions. I'll just let you all Google that. Um, but Google Expeditions um, has several expeditions, not just around the world, but also like to the space station and underwater coral reefs for environment and so on. Um, but if you're using droid devices, um, not iPhones, unfortunately, but if the students are using droid devices, they can actually create their own expeditions, including the little information cards that would be used by the person leading the expedition um, and others can join. And on their headsets, they don't see the information card. They just see the pictures and the images and the student or person leading it has actually the little information cards to, about what they wanted to say about each image that they're directing their viewers to. Anyway, that's just, it's an amazing way to bring people to a variety of types of places that would be relevant to the work that we're doing. Um, so how do your learners use authentic materials as they, and Adam, I'm going to let you continue because you actually touched on this. How do your learners use authentic materials as they make choices regarding project topics, project activities, and even the products that they will ultimately create as part of their projects? So our students actually have to do a, a bit of research. So again, referencing back to the water project, if, if a team decides that they want to look at, at, uh, at uh, um, recycling water as their topic, then they may have to go to research, well, what are methods of recycling water? This is, can be a little tricky because by and large, there's not that much information in Chinese on that topic. So we ask them to say, find what information you can. And if you say, if you find an infographic about building something, then their project is to go ahead and build it themselves and then create their own video where they have to 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 translate what they what they found out into Chinese and that's the process as they go along uh, in some ways but for but for other kids they are able to find other um, statistics sometimes that they are able to 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 show about uh, uh, problems about water conservation in different areas of the world. So they're actually doing a little bit of analysis, looking at, for example, droughts in uh, Singapore 
uh, and Israel, as well as California, and then different uh, methods that they may use for that. So it, it really, the sky's the limit. It, it's up for the, the kids to decide what they want to do, and this is where the, the voice and choice comes in, although it, it, might, it might need a little bit of help of work to find materials that are in the target language or finding ways to translate materials that if you can't find uh, anything that's in the target language. Yeah, that's a really good point. And Rachel, I'm going to ask you to quickly just add, if you have one quick thing to add to that, so that we're going to turn it over to a few questions. After. Um, Sure, yeah, I'll just try to go really quick. So um, in my case, the authentic materials or the books were sort of an inspiration for their project, and they actually made a guidelines, which I based my rubric on for the overall project. So that's a separate rubric from the one I talked about, not to confuse everyone. Um, so that actually became sort of how their final project was graded. So by them looking at the criteria of what was a good children's book that helped them build um, the criteria that I would use to give them their final grade over the project. And also to look in a critical sense at the children's books and not only look at what was there, but what wasn't there in terms of representation of the characters, um, et cetera. So, yes. Yeah, thank you. I really, really like that sense of that the students through their own evaluation of the of samples of the product they were going to create, they determined what the criteria was for successfully completing the work they needed to do. Um, so before we close completely, I'm going to ask our helpful staff and moderators over at the NFLRC at the University of Hawaii um, to jump in with any questions, one or two questions that they think we should address. Hi, this is Jimmy Yoshioka. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes, good. Um, most of the questions you answered either in your presentation or your chat, but we do have some extra ones. So. Um, um, Adolf writes, uh, in order to facilitate target language comprehensibility, how would you proceed to create comprehensible interaction among the learners and also between teacher and learner? One of the really important things, I'm going to break that question up. It started with the comprehensible input piece and then led to those interaction pieces. And that's an important thing to notice because Ultimately, our students can't be expected to engage, for example, in spontaneous interactions or and even produce language presentationally if they aren't being immersed in the language during the time that they're with us at least. Like I did not teach in an immersion school. It was critical that I designed learning experiences that were structured to take them from where they are today and build that next piece that they're going to need. And in doing so, providing those checks for understanding that aren't just some of the things you might be thinking of. For example, they might start with quick yes, no questions and then either or questions. But then the last one might be a very short turn and talk um, where they're practicing, you know, using stems or frames in the question topics with their partners. And then we add the next layer of instruction. And then we do another set of checks for understanding that start with the easiest kind, yes, no, and lead all the way up to more open-ended checks. And then if there's a third piece to instruction, we might progress to that. But if I don't structure that in a way where the input I'm providing is comprehensible and I'm verifying that not only do they understand these new words or chunks, but that they're starting to be able to use them themselves, I can't have my students engage in those interaction experiences later. Um, it's so, and interestingly, if I just teach content in French and then do everything else in English, that also hurts their ability because now they're not seeing the, they're not seeing French as a useful language for communication. They're seeing it as an academic task, but when I really want to say other stuff, I'm using English with them. So, those things we were talking about earlier with the high leverage teaching practices about even using the target language, knowing they won't understand every word, but for that chit chat as they enter the room and so on is also critically important. Nicole, I'll jump in here a little bit. Um, I actually taught our seventh graders at the, the very beginning of the year for six weeks because our, our, um, our Chen Laoshi, who I mentioned before, was on maternity leave. And we had a unit on, uh, on talking about how does one uh, take responsibility? And this is working with seventh grade students and, and learning how to, 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 to 
take more responsibility in the classroom and in their in their own learning. And so, you know, we had a number of readings um, about, that other students had written um, and some other authentic tasks texts and then we gave them some situations so we said next week we're all going on outdoor ed what are things you're going to do to maintain your own safety and other things and then come up with your own ideas and then I actually used a padlet for this and a padlet is a tool where it's almost like an interactive blackboard where a student all the students will have a link and they're able to type directly with their ideas and then you the teacher can monitor so all the students are thinking together um, they might be making some mistakes as they go along and I can go along and correct their, their, their characters or their speech or their phrasing as they go along and they have some time to, to process us a little bit and then everyone is able to look at each other's ideas then we can do a turn and talk and say pick the three best ideas that you, you have as well as maybe a couple that you shared about things that you're going to watch for your safety during outdoor ed and this is a these are kind of scaffolds that you can put in to, again, give lead time for students to, to consider what they want to do, um, build skills, correct things as they need it in a, in a very safe and formative environment, and then build true and interaction. Perfect, thank you. Um, Padlet is a great tool, it's spelled P-A-D-L-E-T. It is freemium, meaning you get three free boards, but if you want more boards, you do pay to subscribe but you can actually your students can record they can do audio video typing drawing links so it's very robust and they can also reply to each other if you give them permission to do so when you set it up um, but we want to create multiple ways for them to begin to share their thinking and share what you know share their knowledge and that is critical to the question that we received. Right, I think ultimately it's your task design and you just wanna make sure your task is level appropriate and that they're, being, they're doing something with the language and that they are able to do it. Um, so I think it really depends on the task that you design for your learners to do and that's what will keep it appropriate and comprehensible for them. And that goes both ways. Um, I was just reading something the other day, you know, just reminding ourselves as teachers, if we need our learners to, pr to produce at the intermediate range, we also have to make sure the task is appropriate because what happens, sometimes we ask a task, we know that they're intermediate, we want them to produce at sentence level, and yet we give them questions or prompts that can be perfectly reasonably answered with a single word. Exactly. It's not fair to ding them for doing what was completely appropriate and what a native speaker would have done, we have to we have to design the task differently so that there's no option to respond with just a single word. Um, do we even have time for one more question? How do adult students respond to materials designed for children, not related to the children's book project, but really related to a project on some other topic? Geography was mentioned. So my students are high school students, but some of them going up to senior year. So they are, in fact, some of them are voting age and legal adults, but they're not college. Um, interestingly, again, depending on the tasks that we're doing and the reasons for which we are interacting with materials originally designed for children, my learners never had a problem with it. In fact, they used to joke about they understood proficiency ranges and they knew where they were headed. And um, by senior year, if they, if they were in a, a four-year program with me, uh, sometimes we would actually look at things from a junior year textbook in France. And they were very excited because they had almost caught up. <laughs> but of course, that was also on a topic that I had facilitated. We had worked on it and I had made it possible for them to engage in that topic. They couldn't sustain it across all topics. But I didn't have, I don't know about Rachel, but my students, um, maybe because of task design and the relevance and the kind of work we were going to be doing, they had no issues working with materials that were originally designed for a much younger audience. Mm -hmm. I just had to be thoughtful about my design and why it is we were doing it. Yeah, like I said, I hadn't, I didn't have experienced any resistance or um, I think there's a certain nostalgia with children's materials, even though I know that's not what we're talking about in the question. Um, but I think also, and I've had students say this to me, you know, I'm an organic chemistry major. I like coming to Portuguese and just working on the alphabet. <laughs> like, you know, for some of them, it's, um, it's kind of nice to have something that's a little bit lighter, so to speak. Okay. 
Thank you. I really first, I want to thank our guests. Um, I know you'll probably join me in the chat in thanking our guests. Rachel and Adam have brought so much to this work and really helped to clarify, you know, by sharing their very personal examples and what their students are doing, what we are talking about when we talk about both high leverage teaching practices and project-based language learning. Um, oops. And so we're going to conclude with, um, as you can see on your screen, First of all, there are some, there's a short course coming. So those are, you're registered um, for this webinar. So you will get a follow-up email later this summer um, in case you're interested in pursuing this work more deeply and applying it to your own practice. And we would love feedback. It's a very short form, I promise. Um, I, I looked at it myself. I believe it has five questions. Um, so um, if you type this link, I think they're going to put it in the chat for you too so that you can grab it. Um, but it, is, it does have to be typed if you're typing it exactly as written. Computers aren't that smart. They can only do exactly what they're told. So if you type anything differently, it won't know what to do or where to go. Um, so you have to do the punctuation, capitalization, and everything just like it says. And we really appreciate your feedback and we appreciate your participation and your questions and your comments today. And again, thank you to Rachel and Adam and to everybody over at the NFLRC who's been working in the background to make this possible for us. And can I say thank you, Nicole? I mean, we know you're an amazing teacher. We know you're an awesome figure skater, but you are also <laughs> such a good interviewer. Like, watch out, Oprah. I think <laughs> you have a second career or third career or whatever. That's really sweet. Thank you. <laughs> for those who are still in the room, good night, everyone. Thanks again for coming. We really appreciated having you here today.